Being district director is actually the best job at Caltrans. The job was a little bit a, as a fireman, working, you know, putting fires left and right. My time as a district director here in San Diego was always you know, challenging, exciting, and rewarding. And I'm pretty sure that you know, all the district directors that came before me and after probably feel the same way. We've all, you know, during our tenure, been able to accomplish a great deal and, and really serve the citizens of San Diego. District 11 continues and has always been very innovative. The San Diego District's first leader was Edward Wallace. When District 11 was split off from Los Angeles, Ed Wallace was taken from Sresno and brought down here as district engineer in 1933. Edward Wallace, we, he was a very, very skilled engineer. He was the first one that came there. He was very prim, proper. Everything went formally like a military organization. You didn't talk to him unless he called you up to talk to you. Uh, Ed Wallace, uh, you know, he served as the district engineer until his retirement in 1955. Uh, and that's when Jake Decima uh, replaced him, but became uh, the first district director, as we call him today. Jake Decima is such an iconic figure in District 11. I mean, very few freeways are named for somebody who's alive, but the 805 is the Decima Freeway. I would share that he's kind of legendary. And in many ways, he's sort of seen as the father of the freeway system we have today. And I think I was the youngest district director ever appointed when I came to San Diego in 1955. At one of our meetings, Mr. Decima came up with something that the other people didn't know about because he is an ardent reader of the Wall Street Journal and what's going on. And he added some things there that others didn't even know about. He was an excellent district director. What he did is he delegated a lot of authority to individual people and he expected them to perform. And as long as they performed, then he left them in the position they were. I don't know what the system looked like when he came here, but a lot of it was built while he was district director. And, you know, when I talked to him, he said that he's, in, in talking to others as well, he spent a lot of time with communities, um, understanding what they wanted, and, and um, he told me sometimes he had to just make decisions and, and move on. My first assignment in San Diego was in 1940 with the bridge department of the Division of Highways. I was building a bridge across the Sweetwater River. He had this very dry sense of humor and, and you couldn't figure out whether he was joking with you or he was telling you the straight thing. Jake had the foresight of plan ahead. And he, he, he told us, he says, right, land was cheap. I mean, it was like dirt patches and we could get, you know, whatever we wanted. I do have one story. It may be a little bit of legend, it may not, but I think it's close. So Jake Decimo was the district director during the first Jerry Brown administration. And so this legend has it, I want, to, I want to make sure I, I, this is the legend as I understand it, right? This legend has it. Uh, Caltrans was in the middle of converting what was then uh, State Route 395 to Interstate 15 as we know it today. And so uh, during that era of the Brown administration, there was a real focus in we're not going to build any more roads, we're going to shrink the roads down and we're going to do more bike paths and other modes of transportation. So in the middle of 15, um, uh, Director Adriana Gianturco, you know, ordered to shrink down the size of 15 from X lanes to Y lanes and, and in essence limit, eliminated the lane. So the legend is that District Director Decima complied with the director's uh, request and mandate at the time. And they ended up building uh, a concrete shoulder and uh, you know the shoulders are typically never as wide as the lane, so they, they, they did all the grading to make sure that it met all the standards of a freeway lane. And so the benefits that we get out of I-15 today are courtesy of Jake Decimo's vision 
because as traffic grew and as another governor came, they were able to move the dirt back, put an asphalt shoulder, and that's the, that's the I-15 that we know today. The planning that he has done over the years you know, is paying off. Well, we built half the freeways I planned on because we ran out of money. He was probably the most outstanding director I think there was. Waddy Detta is most well known at Caltrans for carrying the legislation um, that changed us from the Highway Department to the Department of Transportation. He was very pro-transportation and he liked that. So when Caltrans it was originally called the California Division of Highways and it didn't include aeronautic mass transportation. So we did a study and I was in headquarters, I was on a committee that studied it and we submitted the study to the legislature. My commitment is to make the best transportation system to create Caltrans, Department of Department of Transportation. He's an interesting character. He's a politician, true and true. And he worked really closely with then Governor Reagan during his tenure as senator, and that's when the legislation ended up getting enacted. Ronald Reagan, one morning out of clear blue sky, my phone rang. What? You know what I want from you? What, Governor? I want you to work with me and with my staff to create the best transportation system in the United States. You know why? No, Governor. I, said, I read your speeches about transportation. I read your speeches on the floor of the assembly. I trust you. Of course, Governor. I am honored. Wadi Dada is really the father of Caltrans. I'm the father of Peter Dada only, my son. <laughs> but I'm honored to be the father of Caltrans. One of the things that, that I feel really proud of in working was getting the new building at Caltrans built and then being able to enact legislation to name it after Senator Detta as a legacy for him. And, and we still, you know, Gary, Lori, and myself, we call him our father. I take off my hand, hat in respect for the professionals who are in the transportation department. They are pros, no question about it. In the beginning, there were just ordinary city streets, you know, like El Cajon Boulevard, Pacific Highway, things like that. Those were the main arteries in San Diego that carry the traffic, but no freeways. When I came on board, the um, trolley was operating, and we were working on Route 52 and uh, Interstate 15. Also, District 11 had a very effective project development staff. And uh, this was during the years when we were short on money prior to leading up to this. And fortunately, in District 11, they were not as impacted as some of the other districts because there were federal funds available and they could keep their project development team together. We had a tremendous system. We were adopting and building freeways and designing them all over the place. We had a freeway system going all the time. Everything was happening. It was the golden, golden era of freeways. The first freeway I worked on was Interstate 5 and it started in the South Bay and ran right through the center heart of San Diego. It was highly controversial because they'd never had anything like that before. They just had city streets. I think the Coronado Bridge was one of the things I was most proud of that I had done during my career. Back before I became the district director, I was a district uh, design engineer and advanced planning engineer. And they were running at that time, there were ferries running back and forth from San Diego to Coronado and to build a bridge directly where it was, where the ferries were, would involve going deeply underneath the bay so it could accommodate the largest carriers because they draw a lot of water. 
and he decided to build a bridge instead, but he didn't want to build a bridge there because there was no freeway connection. So we moved all the way down to National City in order to get enough room and get up high enough to accommodate the very largest ships that were there, which was about 240 feet high with big portals. And we built the connections to Interstate 5, which existed. And then it went up, we got up in the air and to get up that high on the grade and get back down, we had to put a curve in to get back down to the grade and get to get into the city of Coronado. I'm also most proud of the, uh, of the major interchange in Old Town where they have Interstate 8 and Interstate 5 run together. And then I did almost, a, when I was a design engineer, of Interstate 8 out running all the way from San Diego into Imperial County. And that's a major achievement before that was a two-lane road. We would build a much more deluxe system if I had it my way. We had freeways planned all over everywhere and they could never agree to them. 78 that runs from Oceanside into Escondido is stopped. We had a proposal to run it all the way through Julian and all the way down to the Imperial Valley. I've been in many different areas in design and also in construction. So it's been a good career as far as I'm concerned and I've enjoyed every bit of the things that I've done in Caltrans. A very significant accomplishment during uh, District Director Jesus Garcia's tenure was, um, today it sounds simple, but back then it was pretty complicated. The, the, the region was having problems with uh, what were known as border runners. And so, you know, they would assemble you know, several hundred at a time and they would literally run up the Interstate 5 knowing that, you know, the CBP agents would probably back off in pursuit just out of their own safety and so they would just literally be running against traffic and try to make their way into San Diego and so that was a, a real challenge because the as, as you know San Diego Freeway is what we call access control so by its very design it's not it's not designed to have pedestrians walking down the freeway it's it's access control so that only only autos can use it and and that was a, a, a real big challenge um, a real human challenge in terms of you know People got hit, uh, they got hurt, they got killed. And <clears throat> during Jesus's tenure, um, you know, uh, one of the things they ended up doing is building a fence, a tall chain link fence between the northbound direction of I-5 and the southbound direction of I-5. And what the, the fence was designed to do and, and has worked really well for several decades now is that, you know, if you run across the freeway you gotta climb over this really tall fence. That's where the CVP guys are gonna get you climbing over those fences. You're not gonna have a clean getaway to, you know, jump over the freeway and keep keep trying to uh, avoid ca uh, capture. And so the, the the fence did exactly what it was supposed to do, and and that very problem went away. Um, it was part of during that time, a graphic artist at Caltrans during Director Garcia's tenure also designed a sign that has kind of become an international sign today and it's a cautionary sign that shows the profile of a, a man and a woman and a, and a child kind of running or trying to walking across the road and that was uh, you know sort of another uh, development that happened as a result of this challenge that Caltrans was facing uh, down at the border with, uh, with, with, with border runners um, and you know to, to date you know the progress, or you know that the 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 project has has worked great. That's not today a problem for Caltrans. In many ways, I uh, see Jesus Garcia as a as a mentor, and he came to work at a at a time there was an interest in sort of diversifying the employees that that worked at Caltrans, you know, to help better reflect the community that we are in, in California. And so he was one of very few early. Hispanic district directors and really Caltrans employees. And here's a, a, a Caltrans employee that did really well and rose to the level of a district director and a, sort of a role model for many Hispanics like myself that followed Jesus. Uh, and back in those days, there was uh, Caltrans uh, in an effort to you know, diver diversify its uh, employment uh, profile. Uh, you know, there was advisory committees. There was a you know black advisory committee. There was a Hispanic advisory committee, and and Jesus, I think, played a very important role 
in uh, championing some of those advisory committees and championing those things, not only locally here at San Diego, but really statewide as a whole. He was the district director in the late 80s and 90s. And I was you know, given the privilege to follow him, so I was able to build on the success that he started. And for that, uh, I will always be grateful. The Transnet sales tax measures were established, ours here in San Diego, the first one was in 1987. It was a special tax where voters agreed to tax themselves one half percent on sales tax to really fund a specific set of projects. And, and back, back in the 80s, you know, there, there hadn't been a lot of emphasis in the San Diego region on sort of the east-west sort of state routes, you know, the Interstate 5s and 15s and Interstate 8s had gotten a lot of attention from the federal government through the interstate program. And so the first transnet measure was really focused on trying to improve the State Route 54s, the State Route 56s, the 52s, the 78s, the 76s, or the east-west routes. And that was passed in 87 for 20 years, and it, it was passed during District Director Garcia's tenure. and and we were able to build on that success so that in 2004, we went back to the voters uh, to ask for another half cent sales tax. The first one was for 20 years, this last one was for 40 years uh, to be able to invest in, in transportation infrastructure. So today, you know, the improvements that you've seen on I-15 and 52 and 905 at the border and the trolley line, the green line that went out to this great university here at San Diego State University, all those were paid for with, with partly through the sales tax measure known as Transnet, where all San Diegans pay an extra half cent sales tax for these transportation improvements. 40th Street, I think a, a project that personally I'm quite proud of because that wasn't always the best part of town. You know, there was a, a community that was struggling and when we finished uh, Interstate 15, 40th Street as we called it, and you look at what's there today, you know, we built a park for kids to play on uh, over the top of the freeway that, uh, you know, gave an area that was very deficient in parks. We were able to do some enhancements with a project that made it an asset for the community. Uh, but, you know, all of a sudden there was more pride in that community. And so with 40th Street, uh, we, we found ways to still be able to build this critical transportation system, but not cut communities in half, build parks, build expanded plazas, so that the community could reconnect itself. And, and that area continues to be one of the most vibrant parts of San Diego today. In the 80s and 90s, it wasn't uncommon to listen to KPBS or listen to talk radio shows and they would say the traffic con congestion on I-15 is horrible. And so we developed a concept that now has become uh, in many ways a, a, a national standard that many other regions are starting to uh, follow what we were able to do on I-15. And we came up with this kind of concept where we needed to build what we call managed lanes. It was in essence a freeway within a freeway. I-15 the managed lane project was a big experiment for, for Caltrans, for District 11, and for the nation as well. And the key to the freeway within the freeway is the second freeway needed to be managed. San Diego, a little before I got here, had already implemented a movable barrier rail on the bridge. And so we took that idea and in essence put it on steroids and said, well, look, we gotta now not make it work for two, three miles on a bridge, we need to make it work for 20 miles on I-15. And so the idea of putting a movable barrier rail into the system so that we could contract or expand capacity, how could we price the road as a way to make sure that it was a positive so it kept things moving and kept that part of the new freeway being very efficient. In essence, that barrier could create additional capacity during peak flows, but we were gonna charge people. So if you wanted to save time, you could use these lanes. And so, you know, what used to be our worst freeway, today is one of our best performing freeways. And a lot of those ideas, you know, came out of Caltrans when 
uh, you know, we had lots of engineers and planners and right away folks, you know, kind of rolling up their sleeves, figuring out how to solve transportation problems. And that there's a, a, a what I would characterize as sort of a showcase project that now is being emulated in other parts around the country where you know, we just can't solve congestion, but we need to manage it. Caltrans's experience uh, with earthquakes you know, taught us a lot about bridges in the region. And so with the last earthquake that happened in Northridge, we were given an assignment to retrofit about 16,000 bridges around the state. Number one priority for the governor and the legislature, clear mandate for Caltrans to say this is our number one priority. It probably wasn't gonna be possible for you know, all that to be done out of Sacramento. So, and having worked as a structural engineer probably didn't hurt me. I approached uh, the director at the time and the, the guy that ran the structures program about how we in San Diego could help by doing some of the work here in San Diego. I had a plan. Uh, I needed three seasoned structure guys and they gave me the authority to go recruit those and I did that. Uh, I would share a story that one of those persons is Lori Berman. So Gary had this idea that we could do the work in the district. Um, that was not met with a lot of, yeah, that's a great idea. Even though there was uh, some hesitation and resistance to you know, having a local district like San Diego do seismic retrofit, which it historically been done in Sacramento, and history's not always really easy to change when people do things for a long time, they get used to them. Uh, but I'm personally very proud that we sort of figured out how to do that and we were very, very successful here in San Diego at uh, being able to retrofit the San Diego bridges and you know, really protect the public and I'm very proud of that. So while uh, we were working on trying to seismic retrofit you know, bridges throughout San Diego County, some were more challenging than others and you know, one of the big challenges that we definitely ran into was the Coronado Bay Bridge. As the project manager, one of the biggest challenges was making sure that the bridge would be retrofitted in a way that was sensitive to the community. I mean, you're looking at an iconic structure within the city of San Diego, uh, a landmark. But within that landmark, there's also other landmarks, and one of them specifically is Chicano Park. The history of that project was CHP wanted to build uh, command center uh, in the 80s and the community rose up against it and that was the birth of Chicano Park where they started documenting sort of the challenges that they had with, uh, with life and, and so now we had to retrofit those columns and they have all these rich murals on them and so the strategy that was being used around the state was to get a steel cover around the columns. So the original strategy not only was it going to change the character of the bridge, it was also going to remove and wipe out all of the murals. Well, the community came unglued, and I almost got killed, and I wouldn't be here to talk about it. But having said that, working with the community, again in partnership, we were working also with UCSD, and one of the things that we did at UCSD was this incredible earthquake lab that they have there where they can replicate earthquakes. So we took members of Chicano Park community to see that so that they would understand what would happen if an earthquake hit and what would happen to that structure because they didn't believe us that it could fall down. Then we showed them basically a state-of-the-art building as far as earthquakes. And it has a very unique foundation system that utilizes what is called base isolators. A question was asked, well, why aren't you guys using base isolators to deal with earthquakes? This little old lady from Chicano Park says, why can't you do that to the bridge? And we're all like engineers, some PhDs, some masters. You know, the, the, the biggest minds in, 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 in structural earthquake engineering were there. 
not much had been done with base isolators uh, on bridges. And I think you know we were bold enough to, to tell that community member, look, you know, we don't know the answer to your question. We think it's a really good question. Let us go do a little homework and we'll be back. So we went back and huddled with our structural engineers. And, and as a result of those deliberations and debates, we worked with then uh, Secretary Dean Dunphy and we approached uh, Secretary Dunphy with you know, the idea of this base isolators. And we partnered with UCSD, of which the state then gave a grant uh, to the University of California at San Diego. And they developed uh, a process to test base oscillators. And we were able to use base isolators on the Coronado Bridge. And by using that technology with a little bit of luck in terms of the soil foundation information being a little bit better than we might have expected, uh, we were able to save the murals. What that did, it built a little bit of trust within the community at Chicano Park, but also to enhance the park and to get some grants to be able to refurbish the murals. I was really proud of getting the murals done. You know, the big projects, the 15 managed lanes, um, those projects are gonna get done um, but getting the murals, um, Caltrans, we deal very well with engineering type contracts and with transportation type things. We had a grant from the federal government for both the Martin Luther King mural on 94 and for the Chicano Park mural restoration. Um, but working through, sometimes working through our own bureaucracy can be a huge challenge. And we were able to do that in, um, with the Chicano Park murals. That, that was a very proud moment for me and for Caltrans. Uh, we were able to enhance the park because we needed to strengthen the foundations. Uh, and today, uh, the University of California at San Diego continues to taste, test base isolators, and base isolators are now being used in bridges around the world. And I think what's so unique about that is that came out of a community meeting with a community member asking a question that we didn't know the answer to but our willingness to go say, hey, we think that's a good question, and bold enough to say I don't know the answer, but willing to go figure it out. In terms of uh, a new border crossing that we're working on, you know, I think um, you know, one can trace the beginnings of where we're at today back to Jesus Garcia's time as district director in the 80s and 90s, and that you know, they started a, a dialogue between Baja and and the state of California and, and uh, where they're sharing ideas, sharing technology, sharing other pieces. And I think uh, Sue's played a very, very key role in, in, in really being an incubator of a relationship that, that, that has grown over the years and has become stronger. With the border, you know, that was something that we been struggling and there was really no, no plan for what needed to be done to the ports of entry between California and Baja California. You see trucks idling at the border waiting to come across and it, it just shouldn't take as long as it does. You know, we've got two, three hour wait times. Um, that's not good for anybody. California's largest export market today is Mexico. We did an economic study to help us understand the importance of the border. And what that study told us is that the, the local region here is missing out on about $7 billion of output. When we put this together and we said, how do we put $7 billion into context that we can talk to the business community and talk to other leaders about what does $7 billion look like? And I think it's uh, pretty well known as San Diegans, we love hosting things. And so we went to our economist, our uh, team, and said, you know, help us put this in context. And you know, how many Super Bowls would we, would we be able to gain if we could make the border crossing work better? And the answer was about 18 Super Bowls. And that cost the Chamber of Commerce here locally to become a big champion of our border. We were able to work with Senator Denise Duchenne, uh, who passed a bill that would allow us to toll the road, toll a road, and use those toll revenues to be able to pay for all the infrastructure that we need. One of the things that during my tenure, we worked really hard is to create what we call the Border Master Plan. And that Border Master Plan became 
kind of like the guiding document of what needed to be done in each port of entry. And it ended up being bought into by all of the federal agencies and the federal government at both sides of the border, on the Mexican side and on the U.S. side. And so we're in the throes today of building a new state-of-the-art border crossing uh, that will reduce border wait times to about 20 minutes. We're working with SANDAG to develop the new State Route 11 and, and new um, Otay Mesa East project, which we've been working on for a while. And when Pedro, and he'll probably talk about when he was district director, he was able to get the um, presidential permit, which you need to build a new port of entry. A presidential permit for a new border crossing at Otay Mesa East. That I, I, I have never worked so hard to try to get a permit Nobody really thought we were going to get the presidential permit. I mean, and I happened to be in D.C. at the same time. He was there for to go around to the State Department and some of the other federal agencies. And, you know, he'd, he'd show up and people would, would uh, they'd listen to him and, um, and work with him. And he was developing those relationships. And um, he really pushed to get the presidential permit. And that was quite an achievement for the district. You know, we went to the federal government and guys like me spend a lot of time with the federal government begging, pleading, arguing for dollars. And this time we were a little different. We weren't, we weren't asking for help. We were seeking permission to help ourselves because the tolls will pay for this and the users will benefit. San Diegans as a whole will benefit. I've been going with Gary Gallegos to DC and to Mexico City to talk to people about you know, moving this project along. And it's only been in the last, oh, six months or so, six to 10 months, that people are really paying attention. It's high on, on the list in DC and in Mexico City to get this project built. And so that's very exciting to see the momentum. I worked on the 125 South Toll Road. It feels like for most of my adult life, I started Working on that, um, I was a design manager, and then I became the project manager, and then the project director. I probably spent 10 or 12 years on that project, and it was very innovative because at the time that the, it was a demonstration, it was a pilot project, and at the time that the pilot was approved, nobody was really doing P3s, public-private partnerships. So California was kind of at the forefront. There were four projects that were approved, only two were built. Um, and it was incredibly challenging because that project, the private sector took all of the risk. That's how it was set up. Um, and later we learned maybe that wasn't, you know, the public sector is very good at, at getting the environmental document done, at go, getting through the environmental process. Um, that's, that's the, there's been a lot of outcomes like that, that at the time the private sector was doing that. So that was a very innovative project. The 125 stayed in the private sector's hands and then filed for bankruptcy and then Sandag took it over. And so it's still a toll road, but now owned by the public sector. Um, some people think that wasn't a successful project. The risk stayed where it was supposed to and the, the public sector did not lose any money when, when that project went bankrupt. Um, so that was kind of the negative side of the project. The positive side is it was our first design build project. Uh, so we had got to have some experience with that, with doing things in a different way, a different type of project delivery method. The uh, Otai River Bridge, which is at the very southern end of the project, is, is one of the most beautiful bridges in, in the region. That was built using precast segmental construction, which is not used very often in California. One of the most difficult parts of working at Caltrans, of being the district director, is I have employees who are out working on the side of the freeway um, every day and most nights and they're working right next to cars going at very high speeds and so it's a very dangerous job and um, sometimes my employees don't make it home at night at the end of the day and that's that's very difficult. In 2011 I had three employees killed in the line of duty in a very short time frame in three different instances and we really stepped back at Caltrans and said, what are we going to do about this? And I, and I feel like since then we've put, we always put safety first, but I feel like we've really done an even better job. And so we've changed some of the ways we do business. We've got a new safety campaign and we've done a lot to improve safety.
your ability to communicate and to connect with people is probably just as important as your technical skills. And my experience was, it continues to be that most engineers come pretty technically savvy, but they really don't come prepared for the communication and people skills. And so whatever you can do to strengthen that, I think the better your career is gonna be. Force yourself to do public speaking or force yourself to be able to do presentations and write letters so that you can hone in on those communication skills that are not and, and sorely missed at being taught at, at universities. Be well-rounded and kind of explore everything. And, and, you know, at Caltrans, we need people who are really engaged in being subject matter experts, but we also need people who like to move around and become more well-rounded. And the department needs both, and I think most agencies need both. So whichever you are, that's okay. My advice to future district directors is to be bold. Be patient. Stay humble. You need to build up a highly motivated, skilled staff. Don't be afraid of failing. Take good care of your employees. And probably most importantly, don't tell yourself no. Every single employee at Caltrans and every single person that you touch deserves your respect and you're working for them, it's not the other way around. It's a very exciting time to kind of be um, thinking about where we've been and then looking at what, what the future might hold in terms of driverless cars, high-speed rail, more active transportation, and still the nuts and bolts of transportation, getting people uh, whether they're going on vacation or they're going to work or it's goods that need to be moved across the country and how is that getting done. So we've got to kind of keep one foot in, in the day-to-day -day stuff and, and have another foot looking ahead to what might come. And the great thing about the future is it's really hard to predict. <laughs>